Innovation. It seems like the new buzzword in legal is innovation because why not? Why not be creative and solve problems? Why not try new things? Why not be a walking hat rack of tactics? A one-man band? A Swiss army woman? We've been told and sold on the idea that if we're new enough, we can get through the future unscathed. But where we're headed, there are no roads. And actually, they haven't been built yet because the dreams of this miraculous law firm of the future don't exist in our shared consciousness because the problems that truly need solving aren't recognizable to our current senses. Indeed, innovation is not about being the best at problem solving, but being the best at problem finding. We are usually so focused on the knot in our hands that we forget about the shoes on our feet and even where we're going. That's what we're talking about today on Lawsome. Innovation, the law, and what it takes to find our way into the future. Let's go. Lawsome. The podcast for law firms. Powered by Consult Webs. Welcome back to Lawsome, the only podcast for law firms that looks both ways before it crosses the line. We're here to inform, educate, and entertain the legal community on the latest personal and professional development. I am Jake Sanders. Starting third baseman for the Pittsburgh Pirates. And I'm joined by Paul Julius, who is a pirate from Pittsburgh. Paul, avast. You're looking like your timbers are properly shivered over there. Uh, yeah, I was going to I was going to talk about shagging fly balls and and stuff like that, but uh I'm now I'm concerned about my timbers. <laughs> They're shivering. You gotta warm oh. these things up, man. Such an amateur pirate, man. I don't know. It's better to, than a professional one. You're a professional pirate. <laughs> well, yeah, but I do baseball stuff. And <laughs> pirating has evolved, apparently. <laughs> and flag waving. <laughs> uh, what's the show uh, contents for today, Avast? Oh, man, we got it all. Today on the show, we talk about legal technology, innovation, and the evolution of the legal services industry with a multi-article hot take. And then we talk to University of Miami professor and founder of Law Without Walls, Michelle DiStefano, about what it really takes to innovate and understanding the changing behaviors and needs of modern legal consumers. And of course, make sure Michelle checks all the boxes. Five questions we ask everyone. Pull up a plate. It's the hot takes buffet. The hot take Buffet is brought to you today um, from the kitchens of law technology today.org. The first piece is um, technologies that are transforming the legal industry. And then the second one is the future of the legal services industry. Paul, you found these. I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what, what, what was your thought about these two things? Uh, or provide a little brief overview on, on, on these. I think both of these articles um, are talking about how technology uh, is transforming things on the inside of the law firm oh, yeah. uh, and also on the outside. Um, there's different you – know, the first article talks about um, you know, blockchain and, and right. um, data, you know, data analysis and all these different things. Um, they're definitely worth checking out. But I, I think the point that we're trying to make with these two articles here um, is that there, there's a big gap, um, I think, between what people are making and what people are actually using. And there's a big gap here because these two blogs are written by product marketers who are legal tech vendors. And so this first piece is by Bruce Orcutt. From uh, Abby, which they do, uh, you know, automation, uh, smart contract stuff. But he's talking about: are are you using analytics in your firm, or are you doing optical character recognition, which is a a, a way to look at PDFs or paper and scan it and put it in um, electronically? And then he's like blockchain, just like you said. And you're like, uh, and here he's confusing blockchain with automation. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't even his his company doesn't even use blockchain. So he's using this time to tell lawyers that they need to be thinking about blockchain when he is marketing a product that doesn't even use the chain. And then the second one is the same exact thing. 
Bruce yeah. Chalmers is from another legal tech vendor company. Um, it does data management for law firms. They're doing like business transactions. But it's, it's just using this new law lingo to rope people in. And then tell them that they're not doing it. And then in the end, it's a pitch. But it reminded me um, of your experience at the ABA Tech Show. And we can just, you know, just drop that hat real quick. And then we can, you know, go into the end. What, what it remind it, it, this is it. Uh, it. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, there's, there's a whole, um, there's a whole, we, we talked to it later. Um, with Michelle uh, about how at the ABA tech, so there's a whole, um, startup row, you know, mm -hmm. there's this whole thing over there of, of all these people who are starting these companies. Um, and I mean, some of them, I ran into people who were like, I, I mean, I'm not the, um, hippest when it comes to blockchain. I don't do any cryptocurrency or anything mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. I could, I could not even understand how they were trying to weave this in. Like, it seemed like they were like, here's this thing that we're going to bend into whatever it is we're trying to sell you. Mm -hmm. Um, as opposed to this solves this problem. Mm -hmm. Um, mm. you know, so I, I, it was extremely weird. Um, there was a big gap in stuff that I think I, I gotta tell you, man, to, to, to be point blank about it. Um, there was a lot of, first of all, before I, before I rip on this, uh, I met a lot of really cool people. There were some great ideas. Uh, I think there's some some very uh, forward thinking, innovative, and mm -hmm. useful products mm -hmm. uh, that will be with us for many years to come. Mm -hmm. That being said, uh, one of the attorney practicing lawyers who actually had their own product that is out on the market is not part of any of the show or anything. Successful. Uh, we we were walking around together, and they were just like, you know. Most of these people ain't even going to be here next year. And that's the truth. And they had been going there for numerous years and said, I, these are all new faces. Mm -hmm. They weren't here last year and they won't be here next year. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the sad truth of it, mm -hmm. you know? And, and it reminded me of what Greg Garman said um, on a previous episode here. You know, when we go around the country to legal tech conventions, there's really, really great companies, but none of them are really changing the business model. The practice management software, you know, we use it in our firm. Really great software that makes us, you know, more efficient. It allows us to bill more hours a day, get our, get our invoices to the clients easier, store our documents better. That's all great. But none of it really changes the business model. And I think what we as an industry need to focus on and what we at Law Clerk are focusing on is giving tools that actually allow you to go, if you're a lawyer, to go look at what you're doing and look at how you're doing it and try and find a way to cut down on overhead. Tech vendor companies just competing for smaller slices of existing business models um, to bend their things around it, as you were talking about. Um, it's, it, it's just like they're, they're, it's just decorating the table rather than changing the, the fundamental nature of the way the model works and exists and builds itself and innovates maybe for itself. Um, so you need well, and two, one right. point on it as well is that um, big companies are pouring money into this. Right. I mean, I talked to one guy there who had like a, man, I forget exactly. It wasn't with blockchain, <laughs> but it was just as mystifying. It had to do with like text messaging and, and uh, um, I, I honestly, I can't, it, it kind of blurs into the other stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, but they were funded by Google, mm. you know? And like, mm -hmm. it, it's just it's same kind of thing. Like, it's almost like, uh, there's this kind of culture there that is, um, mimicking the, the startup, uh, venture capital Silicon Valley thing that's happening where, you know, pitch, 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 get funded, get through first stage, uh, iterate. You know, like you say later on in the, in the, in the episode, you know, you, you, you go to market and break it, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like that, that's, that's not what we're talking about. And I think, um, Michelle has a completely different approach with this that, mm -hmm. that is effective, um, and realistic. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it's talking about innovation is not so much about problem solving but having the ability to find the problems that need solutions. 
And there's yeah. something about that paradigm shift, f- five different aha moments, um, and so many revelations that Michelle gets into. Legal Upheaval, her new book that's, that's out. Um, it's just amazing that we got her on the show. And she talks on this, honestly, amazingly candid, fresh, creative voice. And, and she's actually doing it, changing it from the business level, from the legal school, from the tech school, uh, you know, from the tech side, all of this um, coming together in the interview. Let's go to it. Let's go. After these messages, we'll be right back. Any lawyer looking to grow their business online can generate more leads from their website by hiring ConsultWebs. After working with lawyers exclusively since 1999, we've tested thousands of web designs and marketing strategies, so we know what flips and what flops. For more information, visit www.consultwebs.com today. And now, a lawsome interview. Recognized by the ABA as a legal rebel, Michelle DiStefano is a professor of law at the University of Miami, guest faculty member at Harvard Law, and the founder of Law Without Walls, a multidisciplinary international think tank of over a thousand lawyers, business professionals, entrepreneurs, and law and business students that collaborate to hone new skill sets and mindsets and create innovations at the intersection of law, business, and technology. Her new best-selling book, Legal Upheaval, focuses on collaboration and innovation in the law. And it's this book and her amazing work on social media and within legal tech that brought her to the attention of the show. And we couldn't be more honored to have Michelle on Lawson today. Michelle, how are you? I'm fantastic. Thank you so much, Jake and Paul, for having me here today. Oh, well, you know what? This book has been making a big splash and and I was excited to... um, have a slice of your time. I mean, sometimes I reach out to people not knowing if they're too fancy or famous, um, but I'm so honored that you got back to us. Uh, let's talk about the book, Legal Upheaval. What are we upheaving? What's the vision of the book? Kind of the, the, the overview. Well, the real vision of the book is to inspire lawyers, no matter if their business model is broken or not, to try their hand at innovation. Because I believe that in the process of learning how to innovate, we actually hone the mindset, skill set, and behaviors that delight clients. Mm. Mm. And, that's, mm. <laughs> and that's it. I mean, it seems like a bigger book than that. That just seems like a nice <laughs> pamphlet that yeah. I get. And you just say, hey, go, go forth go, and innovate. Be innovative, innovate. <laughs> well, you know, this call for innovation has been happening for a few years now. And lots and lots of lawyers are A, sick of hearing it, and B, don't know what anyone means by it or how they're supposed to do it or how they're supposed to find the resources to just suddenly innovate or become innovative. So the impetus behind the book was, what in the world is everyone asking for? And what do we mean by it? And mm-hmm. are, are there, is there innovation? Are there best practices in innovation? So I went off and I interviewed hundreds of general counsels heads of innovation at law firms and law firm partners from around the world to try to dig into those questions. Um, so the first part of the book, as you said, is, is not the pamphlet part, but the per- <laughs> first part is about the upheaval, right. what's changing, what's not, and what do we mean by that? One of my interviewees calls the newest four-letter word, um, innovation. Mm-hmm. Nice. <laughs> the well, four syllabic a, word, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's important to to note that um, this isn't just opinion. I, I'm really glad you said that. There's you know hundreds of people that you've talked to, um, but I think one thing that's very interesting is that you don't really treat um, legal as existing in a vacuum, which is something that I run into uh, talking to people about legal tech. That you very much recognize that you know. Uh, upheaval is happening everywhere. You know, the world is changing and it's not affecting, um, you know, just this or just that. And, and particularly with how consumers behave and what they expect. Um, I think that's, that's Mm. one of the more fascinating things about it is that it's not about, um, I'm going to start using blockchain in my law firm. It's about how am I going to meet these customers needs who now are used to using, um, voice search. Mm. You know what I mean? Hmm. Yes, I do. Um, I mean, part of it is I have eight years of marketing and advertising experience before I went to law school. So in my 
history, I have been taught since I was very, very young to care about the target audience and to try to put myself in their shoes. So for me, there is no answer and innovation is in, is falls on deaf ears if you haven't considered what the client wants. So for example, in Law Without Walls, I have the teams play an exercise I created called What I Love Most. And basically, I ask them to answer what they love most, like what is their best service experience, whether it's Subway or getting their hair done or going to the spa and to name three attributes. And then the, their favorite product, their favorite advertising, and then the, mm. their favorite learning experience. And that mm. could be from learning how to ride a, a bike with their, their parents or you know, a Harvard Law School executive education course um, the, in which I teach. And you take all those adjectives and I say, now those are the things that your clients probably also want from you. Um, and I think that ha- there's like an aha moment on that. Whoa. Wow. Absolutely. Can you, um, can you tell us a little bit more about the, the Laws Without Walls project? Yeah. So Law Without Walls is team-based executive education. We put lawyers from law firms and lawyers from corporate legal departments on teams with law and business school students um, from 35 schools from around the world, and along with some volunteer mentors, business professionals, entrepreneurs, academics, and they go on a 16-week innovation. They are assigned a real problem that a legal corporation, that a corporate legal department is facing, like Spotify, um, Microsoft, HSBC, um, or a law firm like Eversted Sutherland, White & Case, or a law consulting company like Accenture or LegalZoom or Leah Cooper Consulting, they assign our topics to these uh, to these teams. And the team's charge is to, within that challenge, whittle it down to a very narrow problem for a very discreet audience, create consumer stories, identify pain points, and then create a solution with a real prototype, a business plan and case a commercial and a dynamic presentation. <laughs> wow. Jeez. That is dope. So, so, well, now, so, so the, the laws without you founded this company. And then, so Spotify is looking, they have problems. A law firm is having problems with who knows. They reach out. How did you interface this? I mean, this is fascinating that it's actual problems. And in some way, these companies are getting a chance to outsource R and D or a little bit of that market research. How did you, what? That's dope. How did you plug this together? (laughs) Well, as a, as it's true for a lot of innovations, it stemmed from frustration with the hierarchies in law between academics and students, between law and business, between schools of different rank, between, I mean, you name it, between business and law as disciplines. So frustration motivated it. And it's a nonprofit. And it began being very student-centric. The first year and second year were all about the students. And what I learned through that process was that the people that were getting the most value were the actual practicing attorneys, as opposed to the the students are getting the value too. But the practicing attorneys, in addition to, as you say, the companies getting this R&D and importantly, all this fresh, all these fresh eyes and fresh viewpoints we're, we're probably the most diverse community in the law marketplace. 60% of our folks' first language is in English. We have fifty to 60, people from 50 to 60 countries involved. So in addition to that R&D and that great diversity of viewpoint, for the companies, what, what the people in it, um, the practicing mm. attorneys in it, and the companies are getting is uh, new skills, new mindsets, new behaviors. And that's something that you cannot buy in a classroom format. Or, or, or in a book, you know, a $300 book from the ABA, you know. <laughs> okay, don't even get me started about the price. Of my that's, a, that's another I, podcast. I, well, I think I negotiated and failed. It's, <laughs> well, it's, it's fascinating though, because you're actually, um, you know, walking the walk here because this, this is innovation, you know, and you're just demonstrating like, look, this is one way to approach it. It doesn't have yeah. to be, you know, someone just searching github for you know trying to make their app work um right. there, there's there's a bigger picture to this mm-hmm. i'm curious when you say that the 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 law firm owners or the 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 practicing lawyers were the ones that got the most out of it um meaning in a in a in a business sense or a problem solving sense or just mm-hmm. like a, a different way 
you know, we talked about an aha moment before. I mean, is there something like, can you see like a light bulb go over these people and, and, you know, they suddenly realize there's a, there's a different way to, to think about practicing law or yeah. I'm just interested what, what, what you were, you were leaning towards there. Yeah. So probably, um, I would say two things first, it's not about problem solving because we teach lawyers how to problem solve and research shows that lawyers are off the charts. Great at complex problem solving. What we aren't as strong at is problem finding. So Tina Selig and Daniel Pink, both authors who I admire and read everything they write, both of them talk, talk about how the best problem solvers are the best problem finders. And what problem finders do is they spend more time on the problem up front so that they don't end up solving a symptom or rushing to solve and missing the mark. So they ask more questions. Um, and it's not that lawyers aren't inquisitive. But in Law Without Walls, you learn how to do the five whys and you learn how to sit back and problem find for a lot longer, almost so long that you're uncomfortable. Uh, and that is the difference. Mo lots and lots of law firm partners will say to me at the end of it that their team back at their firm, not the Law Without Walls team they're working with, but their team back at the firm will say, oh my gosh, what have you done with Craig? Mm -hmm. Meaning not I've disappeared with this team, but I approach meetings differently. I approach... Um, how I lead differently. I approach teaming and collaboration differently. And most importantly, I approach collaborative problem solving differently. Mm. And it's that, yeah, different approach uh, that um, makes the difference and is the aha moment. I'm having a little bit more of an aha moment, maybe a, a side dish to the aha entree. Um, the Promethean kind of idea of going and getting the fire and bringing the fire of knowledge back to your tribe. You know, there is this egoic plucking of the string that, that, that doesn't really comport with the actual work that needs to get done. And I think a lot of people quest for self betterment and mastery to make themselves better and not a law firm and not a model and not for their people. And, and it seems like this project is helping because there's people who are hustling, Gary Vaynerchuk's, Tony Robbins, you know, all these people, you know, you got to hustle, you got to go back, you got to lead, you know, you got to be a general, you know, and, and all these things, but it's actually not that the, the real work, the real innovation is not this leading military strategic thing. It's actually this collaborative working together, finding problems. And I just, I just think for, for some people who are questing for mastery, how do you help break their ego from it? Because it's, you know, I, do, do you deal with that? Is this, is this yes. an ancillary yes. aha thing or what? Well, I mean, so Chris Avery wrote this book years ago, 50 years ago. And, and I mean, the title, it, it's one of those situations where, yes, it's a great book, yet the title says it all. And his title is Teamwork is an Individual Skill. And this is something that people often forget, and we have to work on ourselves first. So we talk a lot in Law Without Walls about um, the fact that there may be no I in team, but there's two I's in innovation. And <laughs> uh, yeah, right. I can count. Okay. And um, those two I's are one, um, the identity of the lawyer as a lawyer, and how immediately when we put our little lawyer robe on, we act a little bit differently and um, perform to that role. I mean, uh, granted, it's true. Oftentimes, lawyers are the most educated people in the room in terms mm -hmm. of the number of years that they've been mm -hmm. in school. Mm -hmm. So there's this lawyerly role. And then the other eye is the lawyer as the individual. And um, Carlos de la Pena, in his recent book, um, Lessons from Mars, and he doesn't mean like out of this world, he means the candy bar company, although I'm sure they don't want to be called the candy bar company because they do a lot more than candy bars. Sure, 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 but sure, anyway, sure. Um, he talks about this as well, and he talks about how this other eye is the individual. Look, we're all born to only focus on ourselves, right? If you've, mm -hmm. if you've ever played with any three-year-olds or four-year-olds, it's me, 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 me. Mm -hmm. And so you take the combination of the lawyer identity and our role and that individual um, intrinsic motivation that's just natural to self-preservation, and we've got some problems. And so we actually, everybody at our kickoff, we talk about the lawyer's mindset, the lawyer's temperament, and the lawyer's training, and how that actually creates two crutches for us and prevents us from being collaborative. 
And so we try to break down that I at the same time recognizing that if you're not going to commit as an individual to working on your own issues with collaboration, we're not going to get anywhere. So we try really hard to strip that, that ego down. So, I mean, and there's tons of, if you think about training programs where you go to them to better become a better leader or become a better mentor or whatever it may be, and it's a week and you get inspired and maybe you leave home with a couple things, Mm -hmm. but after another week goes by and then another week goes by, another week goes by, how much do you really keep a hold of in terms of change? Mm Mm-hmm. Almost none. We hear it all the time. People get fired up by this conference, but when it comes down to saying, all right, now it's time to, you know, walk that path. um, They're still ill-equipped to start taking those steps. Right. I agree. 16 weeks in Law Without Walls, it becomes second nature. You, 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 You now will not say you want to do a conference call. You will say, what? Why would we do a conference call? We can Slack video or uh, do a Skype video or do a Google Hangout. And if that doesn't work, we can go to a Zoom. We have like 18 options and we can quickly hop on and we can see each other's faces and we'll get so much more done because I know that Michelle, if I give her the conference call option, she's going to be making breakfast for her kids, putting her makeup on and probably answering some texts at the same time that she's answering this call. Sorry, Mm. that's. That was a little bit too much self disclosure. No, no, no. I no. I no, just, I just, <laughs> I just found something. Um, I was looking up a personal gazebo, like something that I could just take with me and just close myself in if I was in a meeting that I wasn't feeling. I just, cause you know, shut the shower curtain. And they actually yeah. have shower curtains that have pockets for people's iPads and iPhones. And I was like, well, hold on now, is that innovation? <laughs> That's a different I'm, kind of meeting, bud. I'm thinking like, what? what is this? And who's like, That's you know what? That's a new what? type of multitasking. Yeah, I need to get stuff done and I can't shower and get stuff done. And they're like, hold on, I got an innovation. Um, no, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I am thinking about this because people trying to market their firm, people trying to be distinct, um, people trying to bring some of this innovation in, in-house. Um, they, how do you invest your time? There's countless CLEs, there's seminars, there's executive coaches, there's business coaches that will just come in there and flagellate you. Um, <laughs> what, what, what's your like step one advice? You know, if you just had a, a, a JD and she's just about to hang her shingle, I mean, what would be your piece of advice here uh, for her? Um, two things. First, I'd say go become a barista at Starbucks or get a job as a bartender because the professors and the last three years or four years or whatever it is, you know, depending on where you went to law school, whether it's an undergraduate degree or a JD in the States or, you know, whether, wherever it is during that period, we beat some of your, um, great, uh, unique abilities to communicate and connect with people out of you and go back into the real world, into a service job and, feel what it's like to actually have to serve people and be at their beck and call. And I I feel like everybody forgets that. And too many lawyers have never been in a service job. So that's number one, because once you do that, you will love any client that has a law degree. (laughs) They're a lot more reasonable than a lot of the customers that are at Starbucks trying to get their coffee exactly the way they want it or their drink. So that's number one. And then number two, find a community where you can extend your networks beyond law. And Law Without Walls is a great way to do that. You can give your time and learn at the same time and then be connected to people from all over the world who have different interests, different expertise, but care about one thing, and that is change in the legal marketplace. Mm-hmm. Oh, Have I convinced you guys? To no, I, no I'm, walls I'm, up, I'm <laughs> upheaving everything right now. I'm just upheaving this. I'm going to upheave that over no, there. It's... It really connects because the episode that just came out recently with uh, Autumn Whit Boyd, you know, she was talking about content marketing and, and the different ways. Of, she said that she spent a lot of time reaching outside uh, of legal marketing mm-hmm. and law firms into yep. comparative businesses, uh, service industry stuff. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's just amazing that it's it's kind of you know okay. you kind of brought that circle all the way back and saying, mm-hmm. look, don't you know take those blinders off and look around because you know you you may have some of the same problems. Not maybe in, in the same context, 
but you're you're still overcoming the same thing as a business mm-hmm. owner or as in a service industry. So mm-hmm. it's uh, oh my gosh, yes. I mean, that's the problem right now is that for some reason we've forgotten that we are professional service providers. And I'm a big believer that this call for innovation is a call for transformation of service in disguise. And also, I'm a big believer in exaptation. So I read Stephen Johnson's book, Where Good Ideas Come From, years ago. And he talks about exaptation as it relates to innovation in more general sense and as it relates to even animals and how they exapted and the panda bear and their thumbs. And I created an exercise around exaptation. And all the teams have to go find um, things that are working outside of the law and exapt attributes into whatever their solution is to make their solution better. Mm. Mm. That sounds really difficult. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> but <laughs> but you have to think like complex problem solving um, yeah. in an abstract way because a lot of business books are case studies and you have to yeah, exact oh, whatever that information is. Yeah. And you're like, oh, so Nabisco and Kodak had a merger um, and they made cracker cameras. And, uh, and, and I'm supposed to then take this cracker camera idea back to the law firm. And you're like, guys, we need to make edible PDFs, you know, and I, yeah. and, and it, it might not be what we need, but I think it'll right. be the tasty decision that, that maybe we'll, you know, see. Well, us so through. it's less about the exacting the exact idea and it's about exacting the attributes of what makes it successful. So if you looked at, um, an app like, uh, what's your favorite app on a on your phone right now? Which one, what app is saving your life right now? Hmm. I mean, none of most of them are making my life difficult. Um, Google Keep, that's yeah, mine. That's Google a good Keep. one. Thanks. I don't even know that one. What's Google Keep? I'm it's like an, it's like a notepad kind of thing. Like, but it it syncs. Uh, like if you're if you're in um, the Apple um, atmosphere, I guess you'd call it. It's kind of like Apple Notes. Um, their their notepad thing. But Google right. Keep is pretty cool. I can drop in pictures. It's just it's like a it's like a man. It's like a quick a, 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 b- before before I, like I remember a time before cell phones and all this stuff. And I was a big uh, post it note legal pad guy. Oh yeah, and this this has taken the place of post it notes totally. legal pads for yes. me. Okay, so just imagine if I said to you, okay, let's try and make your podcast better by taking one attribute from Google Keeps and giving it to your audience. So how could, how might they post it these these um, podcasts so that they are reminded to watch them or they put their best ones in one place or they share them in a different way? So that's what I urge the teams to do to try to get them to think outside of the box. I hate that uh, phrase, but sometimes um, we can do more creative thinking when we're constrained. I mean, there's a great example of that, like what Apollo thirteen. Uh, when it was going down and they had to actually work with what they had, they were constrained. So sometimes we can be more creative if we have to use some attributes of something else. But, and and, you know. and to, 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 to that point really fast, the, it wasn't a fail fast mentality or modality that they were going at those problems because that's when people get incinerated. Uh, you know, it, it was a very slow, methodical and very deep dive into what they had. Um, and so to find those problems. So, so it's, it's an interesting thought because we think we're just going to go smash some Legos and then reinvent the pancake, you know, um, but it, it's, it's not about that. You know, it's about a people coming together and, and it's, that's a great example. Um, so, well, I'll just go for it. Law schools. I mean, talking about this collaborative place where people <laughs> should be working. It sounds like law school. sounds like that should be the place. Um, you have law without walls and you're involving students. Um, what do you think law schools today are getting right? What do you think they're getting wrong? Uh, is there any upheaving that needs to be done there? Oh, there's a ton of upheaving that oh needs boy. to be done. Oh boy. Yeah. How long do I we mean, have? I mean, oh boy. Exactly. I, <laughs> we could have done a couple hours on this. <laughs> what, we're still taught that individual individual accountability is what matters. We're graded based on our individual contributions and collaboration is not taught. And moreover, professors aren't trained to teach. <laughs> they just Sorry. let them in off the street. They're like, oh, the clown car's here. They're like, come on yeah. in, you got tenure. Um, right. we talked, we, we talked to professor, uh, Renee Allen, um, from, from UT law and she, she was talking about 
a lot of lawyers who are teaching uh, law haven't practiced law in a while. I haven't practiced law in seven years. And so, but yet I'm in a position to influence folks who are going to be lawyers. And and I'm, you know, I'm a baby in my environment. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I do, you know, I I think we have to be open to thinking about how we can do this in a different way. Um, One of the proposals that I saw that I think law schools might be open to is giving professors sabbaticals to go back out into the market. You know, so, I mean, it's not that they just pull them off the street, but they haven't necessarily had the street, you know, connection to bring to their education. I completely agree. I've yeah. always thought we should have some type of, um, you know, ec- you know, extraneurship um, program. <laughs> I love these or, words. Exactly. Sorry, I love extraneurs- making up words. <laughs> oh, we, oh, I'm all about So it. do we. Uh, something where lawyer, the law professors go off and have to actually do real work and then they can bring it back to the classroom. I think that's really important and missing. And by the way, lots and lots of schools, if you have more than six years of experience, don't want you. You can't apply for a tenure track position. So just imagine all the professors out there who are my age even, who practiced for only six years. Now I had a career before law school, so I'm not as further along in my um, career in law, although I'm tenured. So they haven't practiced for 20 years. Uh, How can you know what's happening in the real world? The other problem is most academics don't think the real world matters. And they want you to be theoretical, not descriptive. And they don't think that scholarship is of that much value if it's descriptive and, and then predictive based on the real world. And I'm not saying that there isn't a place for academic scholarship. There certainly is. Yet when it comes to what we're doing in the classroom with students, not only do we need a little bit more practical experience and touch points with reality, but we also need to be trained to how, on how to motivate people. I mean, I've been motivating people, and that's been my job since I was 12. My very first job was as a mini magician. And I was a spinning instructor for years, up until two years ago. I like motivating people to change the way they think about things and to change the way they act. But not all professors actually want to do that or have experience in doing that. So even if you have the practical experience, believe me, I've seen a lot of lawyers come in to lead a guest session, and they're not very great at, you know, being teachers. So I think the training part is important as well. It's funny you bring that up because uh, I was recently at the uh, the ABA Tech Show, and I you know, I'm not a lawyer. So a lot of this stuff, you know, the CLE stuff in particular doesn't apply to me, but, um, uh, there was a lot of, I, I don't want to say negative feedback, but it was almost kind of side eye at, at some of these presentations that were like how to, um, set the presets on Microsoft word, you know, mm-hmm. how to like, some of these things were just very, very basic. Um, some of them were very theoretical. Uh, uh, there was a lot of people who are saying people were just sitting in here, doing their work on their laptops and not um, engaging involved, engaged or, in or, it or whatever. And then Paul um, was talking about splinter groups that, you know, just were kind of isolated, very clickish, um, yeah. which, which is a normal thing, but it doesn't I sound so. like law without walls. You know what I mean? No, I, that, that, well, that's where I was going with it. Like, is there, right. like, yeah. how, how can that be? I'm not asking you to, to tell the ABA how to run their conference better, but I, I just, I was a little disappointed um, that, that there wasn't more people coming out of these things uh, excited about what they learned. Well, those aha um, moments. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I've had two aha moments just now. It's been 30 minutes. Um, well, yeah, this is why we don't have conferences in law without walls. We have symposiums. We make up names and we change it up and we have kickoffs where we do idea generation exercises and hackathons and we team and get to know each other. I mean, snoreboard panels are really, 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 really tough. Yet. Let's put a positive spin on it. Here's what I say to people. That, lots of people say to me, why in your book don't you list more examples of innovations? And I say to them, well, first, I already started my second book where I'm going to have best practices and worst practices. Notice I use the word practices, not innovations. And that's the second reason is because there's not a lot of real innovation or change happening in the marketplace all over, including with ABA conferences. And... Um, Even if there were, innovation is sort of relative in time. So if you put it in a book, then it doesn't seem very innovative about a year later. But the positive spin is 
because the law marketplace is slow to change, just a little bit can make a huge difference. So one of my favorite books ever was uh, Robert Musil's Man Without Qualities. I took law, law and literature in law school and loved it. Not sure how much it made me a better lawyer, but loved the class. And um, in, the, in his book, he, well, he writes about people without qualities, obviously, but he says it's really easy to think in miles when you have no idea the riches hidden in an inch. And that's the beautiful thing about being in the law marketplace, whether you're a lawyer or not. If you're working with lawyers or in this space, all you have to do is move an inch. That's it. And you can add value. Oh, well, but that that's almost like a, that almost just took my anxiety away. I feel like that Good. was just like a little prescription, just a little Xanax or something. You're like, oh, you know, wow. Yeah, you, don't have to use, you don't have to use that iPod in the shower pocket thing. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I'm uh, deleting my that's order. Different anxiety. <laughs> What's going on there? Well, well, I think one thing that's interesting too about the ABA Tech Show is that then you go down to the uh, exhibitors floor, which is down, you know, the, the exhibit halls below where all the classrooms are and stuff. And they have this whole row of people all the way along the back. It's startup row, you know, and they're all these kind of things. And and it's it seems disconnected um and and Mm. i would love it like Mm. it would be so cool if one of those people could be like you know this company that's here this year we started this upstairs last year you know like that i Mm. don't get that it's almost like these people are coming i I don't mean to say these people but i should say these um inventors really um it's it's not connected to like you know this here people who are who are trying to take that inch you know they're trying to move a little bit Um, and it's, it's, they're stuck back on this startup row. (laughs) Well, and you know why there's two reasons why the first Mm -hmm. is because of the hierarchies and walls in law, right? It's interesting that they're on a different floor and separate Mm because you're the innovators or the lawyers. And then secondly, it's what we were chatting about before we got on, which is what I call the field of dreams problem. I mean, just because you build it doesn't mean they'll come. So we've got a lot of these startups on startup row that have built it. Yet we're not seeing masses of law firms, um, big, medium or small or lawyers running to them to do it. And mm-hmm. there's a reason for that. Mm. Um, and and my, might it be in part, there's two sides to every story. So on the one hand, we've pointed out today in this podcast, a lot of issues with lawyers, mindset, their training, et cetera. Yet some of the folks, even the lawyers that have turned into innovators, almost then forget who their audience is. So, you know, they need to market to the lawyers who are keeping them downstairs. And that's a problem for those innovators to solve. Hey. <laughs> 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 Whose um, side are you on? I, I know, know for I real. Vote. Yeah. I'm like the scarecrow in <laughs> the Wizard of Oz. I don't well, know which way. Well, but it's interesting as, as you know, we're a marketing company that makes websites for lawyers, you know, but with this podcast, we've been given an opportunity to talk to people who help us appreciate the market in a brand new way. And there's something about the tactical nature of solving things, which which runs the gamut from uh, you know m- marketing management, all advertising, um, and then self you know prioritization or whatever it is. But I, I think there's a lot of advice out there, um, but there's there's very few people who are willing to say it isn't about the answers. It isn't about these final things that we can look at and say, oh look at that, look at that, look at that. It's actually these beautiful symphonies that we haven't written yet. It's these creative ideas that we haven't uncovered because we don't know the the taxonomy or 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 the 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 language of solving them. So really to be truly innovative you have to really appreciate the kind of generative um adaptive you talk a lot about Darwin and you're talking a lot about these slow moving things that epigenetically take time, but, you know, ultimately lead to huge shifts. I think there's something yeah. fundamental here that, 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 that's, that, that feels right. And there's something that's scary about innovators row and 700 different, you know, Dropbox solutions. That's like, well, I don't even know how to start, how to solve. Um, but really you got to start with yourself and, and, I think we've been given that piece of advice to lawyers too. Just start with yourself. Just look at yourself in the mirror and just say, hey, you, you know, and it's like, well, what does that mean? You know, and you actually say 
it's not about this self reflection. It's about how you can bring yourself to the to the party, um, you know, in a more meaningful way. So this is one of the best interviews ever because you're creative, you're smart, and you're not peddling nonsense around innovation, which is just like just be an innovator. <laughs> you know, it's like it ain't that easy. So if people want to learn more about you, Michelle. Uh, find out this book. Where where can they find you on the web? So you can find me at um, movelaw.com, M-O-V-E, movelaw.com, moving law forward. You can find me, uh, my book on Amazon and also on the ABA shop and also on Barnes and Nobles, Legal Upheaval. And you can also find me on the Harvard Law School website and the University of Miami School of Law website. And of course, Law Without Walls. So thank you so much for having me on the show and, um, you know, being so creative as well and going with some of the crazier things we've talked about. I really, really enjoyed this time together. Five questions we ask everyone. What was the last book you read? Oh, gosh. um, Simply Said. So it's a book by a guy who I got introduced to because... He just wrote a book and then put it on um, uh, like audio and people keep asking me to make my book available uh, via Audible. And so I reached out to him to find out um, why and how he did it. And he wrote a book called Simply Said. And I said, well, I'm going to read your book. Will you read my book? And he said, yes. And so I just read it. And actually, it was great. It was Simply Said. And it had a lot of great reminders uh, about how to communicate, how to present, how to think through difficult conversations. But it was put so simply. And um, I enjoyed it a lot. So Jay I'm Sullivan. Tell him I just plugged his book. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent yeah, book. Yeah. yeah. Check it out. Uh, okay, number two. What is your favorite place? The beach. Any, Any beach or beach. a particular beach? Just anywhere? Any yeah, beach. Three anywhere Mile Island. Yeah. <laughs> Any beach, because for me, the water um, reminds me of home. It means change at all times. Um, it's unpredictable. Uh, it's enveloping, and it um, it makes me connect to myself. Right. That's awesome. Number three: What sites, blogs, newsletters, or podcasts do you regularly check in with? So my favorite, um, I've got two, and one is called Hustle. The Hustle H U S T L E. I'm spelling it only because sometimes when you say things over a radio, you can't mm-hmm. see their mouths. Mm-hmm. And I love that one because it gives me tons and tons of information um, about different happenings in the in the world, all over cultural references, business references, you name it. And also, they are a lot like you two. I urge you to look at it because you will really, really dig its energy. Cool. Uh, the energy of the writers, their tone. Um, they're awesome. So uh, I, I think you'll dig it. Excellent. And the second is uh, Kyle Westerly's. Um, it's a, it comes in every Saturday, and I'm probably spelling the last name wrong. Um, and that one is also a blog that comes in, and it's Kyle Westaway, like W-E-S-T-A-W-A-Y, and it's Weekend Briefing. And he starts everything with prime numbers. And you learn anything from the environment to business to um, innovation to what's happening in Silicon Valley. So it's very, very uh, broad-based. And as you can see, I'm following on my own advice. I'm not sticking to blogs, no offense, or podcasts like yours because they're related to the law. And I feel like the only way I grow is if I learn about everything that's not related to the law. Dig it. Right on. Yeah, we absolutely agree with that. Uh, Okay, number four. If you were stranded on a desert island and could only pick one condiment to take with you, what would it be? Mm-hmm. Like a condiment is uh, like ketchup, mayonnaise, butter. We have a pretty mm-hmm. broad no, definition. It's, People it's been have said, crazy. yeah, I mean, you know, just. Uh, I guess I'd say oil. This like that's motor just or olive. <laughs> I would say some type of edible oil, probably nice. coconut oil, because it can be used for so many different things. And this is smart. yeah, that's a practical, that's answer. practical, super smart. Well, but We've it also people... is very vain. I mean, so I won't tell you how old I am, but coming on a big birthday, and I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, I'm going to be on an island. How will I keep my skin looking? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but it's multi-purpose. We've had a lot of people be like, "Is wine? Is wine a condiment?" And I and then use... someone blows us away. Like one person was like, "Salt." Oh. We're like, "Damn, that's what? really useful." Somebody <laughs> said tomatoes. <laughs> Okay. Well, yeah. all right. I love that we're, if we're going to be that broad minded, I guess I'd say music. Nice. It's a condiment to our soul. Right. Uh, that's absolutely. All right. Number five, after a long day or a long week at work, how do you relax and unwind? Two ways. Number one, I exercise. I do something called bar method, which is a little bit like Pilates, a little bit like yoga, but very different. And um, there's nothing better than a glass of wine. For show notes, links, and info, go to thelawsonpodcast.com or follow us on Twitter or Facebook. Be sure to leave us a review and rating in iTunes or wherever you find the p- you listen to. Until next week, stay lawsome.